Hello, Damien. Thank you so much for joining me on my show today for the Emil Barna podcast. I'm really excited to just pick your brain today on all things martial arts, confidence, kids, uh, your story, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to let you do you when it comes to introductions and that sort of stuff. <laughs> so uh, g- give, give our audience a little bit of a rundown on who you are, what it is you do, and a little bit about how you got into the type of work that you do. Well, uh, Emil, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Uh, thank you for all the audiences listening. First of all, I have to say, excuse my, dis- uh, my accent, my French accent, disclaimer, for my accent. <laughs> the missus always <laughs> laugh about this. She's like, you have to say this at the start because people won't understand you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and the reason for that, because I was born in Mauritius, uh, my mother was always speaking French at home as well as dad, even though these, you know, these different type of languages used in the country where it is their dialect of Creole as well as mm. English, like, you know, what you do at school. And it was always going back to French at home because we have family living in Paris and all around the world. Oh, wow. Yeah. Multicultural island. So we were always going back to the uh, fundamental that the first language will be French, you know? (laughs) So it's always hard when you keep talking to the family, especially now we talk to them every day through technology, Zoom, and all the different ways of communication. And uh, it's had to get it out of my system. (laughs) And you could just as easily do this podcast in French, you mentioned, as you could in English. Uh, Probably better. I can easily... (laughs) I can easily do that. Probably better. <laughs> I shouldn't right. if I can introduce myself in French. Bonjour, je m'appelle Damien. <laughs> yeah, for all our French listeners out there, or our future French oh, listeners, let's see how we go. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Um, so, look, as um, you said before, I've got into I'm a martial art instructor, and also um, we run a company called Empower Tactical, where we empower people, kids, all age group, all ages, all ability. Um, through martial arts and through different aspects of, of um, content delivery that we do, you know, coaching, fear management, um, conflict, and helping basically people to get on their feet, especially in the times that we are right now. Rebuilding, rebuild, rebuilding yourself is very important. Mm. And uh, to teach them on how to do this and to be strong within themselves is very important. And I started all this since I was a, I mean, I started all this. I had this passion to fulfill and support of us since I was a child. Um, I got into martial arts at the age of eight and nine years old. And uh, my mom, who's a school teacher, she was very strict for her. The academic was very important compared to me just having fun on the street, like the old days and, you know, coming down when the sunset is out there. And this is a time that you will get home. And uh, I said, mom, dad will come home and bring all these great tapes of martial arts movies at the time that was Bruce Lee, that was, Jean-Claude Van Damme and all these great martial arts actors, which will bring a great um, impact to the audience watching action movies. And I thought, oh my God, I want to do this one day. And uh, she took me to this martial arts school and uh, started, and it was, I was six months into it. And my, all I wanted to do is I wanted to get a belt because the first belt in karate was a yellow belt. I thought, I want to do this. And I was doing everything possibly could do to get mm. that belt. And now, uh, funny enough, 12 months after joining the martial arts school, she got me to quit. She she pulled me out of this, the martial art classes. And I thought, wow, she's crazy. And I was a kid. You can imagine what it's like. It's like wow, taking yeah. the technology off a kids right now and getting <laughs> them to go crazy and psycho. <laughs> mm. Mm. Nothing made sense, you know? And, uh, and it, didn't, it didn't make sense to me. And I tried to recall the exact um, moment when that happened to me. And I said, Mom, what's going on? Well, why? And I thought, was it about money? What is it? Is that a tuition fee? She's like, no. I want you to take the same principle and the passion that you had to reach that yellow belt to do the same thing at school. Mm-hmm. Once the results get back up, <laughs> wow. and uh, I'm going to get you to join back in. And I thought, oh, my God, I was nine years old. What did she want me to be, a doctor? <laughs> I said that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to happen. And uh, the, the reason I'm mentioning this in the introduction um, is because everything kicked in at that moment, you know. Mm. And I thought, what am I going to do? I was, I was a nightmare as a kid because I was crying. I was 
not happy because all I wanted to do is to do martial arts. Yeah. And then uh, at the time, I was doing four subjects at the school, I think four or five subjects, and the result was like just C, D. And I yep. said, Mom, what do I have to do to get me back into martial arts? And I said, well, as you say, there was C and D. I want all of them to be A. I said, Mom, <laughs> A is like 92 to 100. That's impossible. I said, well, I'm sure it can be possible because you made it possible for someone who's never done martial arts before to get your yellow belt. Obviously, you weren't born in martial arts, and you're not know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, as you may think you are. And I thought, this is crazy, you know? But six months later, I was able to do it. Wow, what a wise my effort into it. I, I put all my effort into it. And until today, uh, every time things get tough, um, mum would send me a, a, a message through this software called Viber. I don't know if you guys know it. And uh, we'll communicate through Viber. It's like WhatsApp. Okay. It's basically like WhatsApp and Viber just to communicate to each other from overseas. Yeah. And she will send me a photo of that certificate of my results. Yeah. And I said, you did it once. <laughs> you can do it again. You can oh, overcome yeah. all your difficulties because I know you can. And uh, what she did after this, she made me a deal, of course. It was always about what she thinks was best for me. She got me to join the scout club. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mom, I just want to go back into martial arts. I said, yes, you will go back to martial arts, but this is what you're going to do once a week. And once uh, uh, the other day, that you will be going back into your martial arts. That's my deal. I would like you to be framed as a good boy. I said, Mom, I'm a good boy. I just got my four A's right now. It's proven, you know? <laughs> so... That day changed my life, and she got me to join the scout club so it can help to make me a little bit more independent and utilize the skills that I had, mm. which I was obviously unaware of what skills I had to be able to achieve what I thought was going to be my livelihood one day. Mm. I didn't know. All I wanted to be is to be a movie star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? that, that's so a, all this change at the time. Of course. It's, it's a really interesting one. Um, did you, was it just by watching those, those films with Van Damme, with Bruce Lee, the ones that your dad brought home and, and kind of showed you, were those the catalysts that I say, Oh, I want to, I want to get into it. Or was it that you wanted to kick someone's ass at school or on the street or something like that? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. I was eight and nine years old. Like, Dad always loved these action movies and was the old DHS yeah. that he'll bring back home. I don't know if you recall that. We use oh, the yeah. pants so we can turn it back quickly so we can rewind it. You know? Yeah. Uh, but you know, if the tape will be you know, stuck into the machine and stuff like that, you have to have a way to put it back together. So I was pretty – I was a genius in knowing I had to do this because this is the only thing I was be spending my time with. You're just sitting at home and watching these movies. Um, and also to remember back in the days – we didn't have any mobile phone, any social media to be able to visualize what's out there. Mm. Um, for us to be able to visualize and have a vision, the only thing that we had it was just basically newspapers and word of mouth or seeing someone or yeah. telling, you know, just to watch on the news. So watching these movies were very inspiring to be able to have a vision created from what you see as being a kid. Because yeah. my dad wasn't into martial arts. Never does, no. Bruce Lee no, no. was making movies in the was it the seventies or the eighties? Seventies, seventies, seventies. So were they? 80s, yeah. um, when you were when you were growing up, when you were nine, was it were they new releases or were they um, pretty, a few years old or so at your time? Few years old. They were a few years old. They were a few years old. Mm. Yeah, they were a few years old. And then in the time, there was a lot of different martial artists. All I wanted to see is the fight scene. Mm. I was yeah. fast forwarding the movie, so I could see the fight scenes and trying to replicate that. Oh. On my younger brother, which didn't end too well. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I um, watched The Legend of Bruce Lee, but that wasn't actually yes. Bruce Lee um, playing in it, I think. I think it was just another yeah. actor who was replicating it. It was another actor. Um, but that's, yeah. uh, I, I never grew up on Bruce Lee movies, but I grew up on on other types of movies that kind of feature. I was, I was born in the nineties. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, well. I grew up with that, that sort of stuff. So it's interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah. growing up, you, you wanted to get into, it was karate, your first martial art. Is that, is that right? Karate was my first martial arts. Correct. Cause that was also the only type of martial arts that was available. Um, beside, I think it was boxing as well, which was mm. available in the neighborhood. And that was pretty common for, people to talk about martial arts and to refer to karate. 
mm. even nowadays when I teach and I have parents coming in and it's like, oh, is there karate going to be on on Sunday? Even though there's Kung Fu everywhere. There's all these ah, different types okay. of martial arts that will train. It's just that people refer to the, the concept of martial arts as karate, depending on the era or the time that they thought what martial arts is about. You know? mm. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to pause and ask, ask, can you hear me still? I've got, um, I can, I can hear you properly, but I can see that, um, the picture is a little bit different on, on your side. Yeah. So that, that's not going to be an issue, um, oh, okay, in the, cool. in the recording. What, what often does with the picture, it, the, what's coming through, and I should have said this at the beginning, um, is going to be lower quality often than what they're recording. So they can save on space when they're, when they're uploading. Oh, all perfect. That. Great. So, yeah. um, I just got a bit of a indication that this is starting to, to lose battery, which is weird because I just, um, <laughs> okay. I just charged it. But, um, if that does happen, we'll just pause it and I'll, I'll replace something else. Okay. That's fine. That's no problem. All right. Awesome. That sounds good. Okay, so karate, you started off with karate. Did you know that there were many other martial arts out there? Uh, I mean, Wing Chun Kung Fu was, was what uh, Bruce Lee did? Well, Is that I, right? Or? Bruce, Lee, Bruce Lee started doing Wing Chun Kung Fu, obviously, when he met the Japan in Hong Kong. But um, Wing Chun Kung Fu wasn't really, uh, you know, wasn't really made famous at the time. <laughs> Wing Chun Kung Fu only was made famous really around the world through the movies of Yip Man in 2008. That's where it became quite famous and well-known around the world where the art of Wing Chun was very popular, you know, unless mm. you were in a, you know, like Australia, obviously there were people teaching Grandmaster William Chung and a few different instructors that were teaching Wing Chun Kung Fu everywhere. So that was made aware from these people in, in the state and the country that they were living or different places around the world. But in Mauritius, there was an, it wasn't made famous that Wing Chun was available for people to learn about this. And again, at the time, as I mentioned before, it's not like we were kids um, where we could just scroll around the street and go around everywhere in different cities and come back home at the age of nine years old, the time that would suit us. Uh, we're living in a pretty strict family that what you would be doing is going to school, coming after school, going home and cleaning and helping the household at the same time and going to play outside doing making sure that you've done your own work at the same time mm. dinner that was at the time and you go to bed at the certain time so we didn't have the freedom to be able to do whatever places us because we were nine years old and we could do the dishes you know <laughs> <laughs> well how much did you have to uh, practice uh to to kind of did you did you take it home or did you just kind of wait until you were doing it at the, at the no, place. no, I was I was very dedicated. I was practicing at home, and that's why I was getting more in trouble at home than getting in trouble in the martial art place by getting hit and punched in the face by someone else practicing their kicks on me. You know, oh, I could okay. remember my mom's like, "Stop it, stop it!" I'll be in the kitchen, I'll be doing the dishes, and I lift my leg and I'll do a side kick. I'm like, "Mom, watch this!" <laughs> She's like, "You're gonna kick someone. Don't do it." I'm like, "Mom, it's pretty cool. Watch this." And and I, and I didn't stop. You know, I was I was just making it a day-to-day -day routine of mm. doing my exercise in the kitchen or running around and trying to <laughs> jump and splits and, you know, trying to kick the the door at the same time. And of course I'll be breaking feet. You know, I can't imagine. I remember one day I was teaching my cousin mm. on how to do flip on their bed and <laughs> they had a bunk bed and they were pretty, they were living um, in a quite, big room and there yep. was a queen size bed in the room and the bunk bed was there. So I was teaching them on how to do flip from the top of the bunk bed to the queen size bed. And I broke it in, in half, you know, I, I remember that day cause I thought I can do this. I can teach you on how to do flip and you're going to land on your feet on a mattress, which is, you know, well, I was pretty confident I could pull that off. And what I pulled off is the, the bed just went like this Ooh. on a V shape and all I could remember is the noise that that made. I could hear my parents' footsteps, especially my mom. She's short, but she's very strong and fierce, running towards to see what happened. And I went through the window and I ran away outside and I climbed up a tree and I didn't come out. <laughs> she was running after me. She's like, Tammy, get out of the tree. Get up. I'm like, no, I'm not coming up. <laughs> no, it's going to happen. Oh, God. Because <laughs> I was too confident I could pull this off. And, and, and the kids and my cousin was like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Never done this before. 
I just thought I could pull it off, you know, because I was doing martial arts. Yeah. And watching a movie, I was always a visual learner. If I look at something, I thought, I can do the same thing. Mm. But no, it didn't happen. <laughs> no, no. So, so your confidence happen. was bigger than your ability at that time. That's it. It was. It was. <laughs> it wasn't confident enough to be able to stand in front of my mum and explain to her, or even to tell her mum I'm sorry, because I thought, no, nah, that's not going to help the case right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're admitting you did something wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I wanted to admit I did something wrong up the tree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, mum, I'm not coming down. No way. <laughs> it was yeah. this big tree in the backyard, and I thought, no, I'm just going to run to there and not come down at all. <laughs> And my Smart. dad ended up getting me down the tree. Yeah, did he yeah. have to climb the up there? That you... <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> you get your two solutions: you either come down or you jump off the tree right now. And oh, guess what? Okay. Of course, I'm, of course, I'm, of course, I'm going to come down quietly. But yeah. you know, we wasted <laughs> nearly two or three hours. I'm like, I'm not coming down this tree. <laughs> I felt bad. I, I, was this? When you were nine years old, or was it a bit older? Than I was that? probably, I was probably, I was probably ten or eleven at the time. Maybe mm. two years later. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> when it comes to karate, how long? Uh, if a person's really dedicated, kids really dedicated, how long can they kind of go from from belt to belt and kind of progress through that? Um, like, what was your experience like? <laughs> Well, you know, you can be very dedicated and you can reach, especially for kids, you can be a black belt within, if, depending on training. Like if you're training every day, like a professional athlete, like you can be a black belt within five years, you know. Yeah. Uh, but remember, uh, also for karate for kids, the level of what you have to do to be a black belt is different to an adult to be a black belt. Mm. So it was different, you know. So the concept is different in different type of martial arts. For Wing Chun Kung Fu, for instance, you know, um, the amount of time that you would spend to be a gold sash will be different to what you would do to be um, doing karate or to do Aikido, to do all different type of level. There's different type of training that you have to do to um, improve yourself and improve your skill level. A black belt for karate will be completely different to be a black belt for karate who is an adult. Mm. or their skill set. You know, if you look at a kid, uh, the Olympics, for instance, a taekwondo who is a black belt, and you look at a skill set, a taekwondo who is a black belt has an adult, they obviously look very different to what they've been learning and acquired from that knowledge. Okay. So, especially this, sparring and fighting, because... Yeah. So, all right. And with the sparring, with the fighting, do you have to, do you have to just present skills or do you have to defeat an opponent to be able to progress to to a belt within... Uh, no, no, it was, it was contact um, uh, point sparring when we were doing karate. It was not like full contact at the age of nine when I would have my face broken and like you see in a professional fighting <laughs> skills here at the time. So but what's it was point scoring? Contact training. Point scoring is basically you have two people together and they're training and they will just, you know, and they will say attack and then one person is going to go in who's never going to touch each other first. That's what point scoring is about. Yeah. Ah. And you will have all your gears, you have your little gloves and everything, which is obviously a little bit different what boxing is about. Um, yep. Yes, you will have all this being a kid. Yeah, okay. So, and, no, go on. No, sorry. Now, I was just saying that thinking back, and I always refer back to the karate old days when we were doing this as a kid, obviously, the environment is different and uh, to what we're trying to achieve at the moment. And that's why I haven't, obviously gone down the path and continuing in doing karate because I've learned through this pathway of learning different skills of martial arts on how can I use a little bit of karate, a little bit of Aikido, a little bit of different type of martial arts to frame someone who would come in and train with us to feel empowered. Feeling mm. empowered meaning if someone we were talking about in the old days, if a kid is getting bullied at school or if they're weak, the parents just say, you need to take martial arts, you will be strong. But taking a martial art class doesn't help someone to defend themselves in the street because the, the dealing with the fear management of it on when that happens to them is different to being part of an academy or a dojo, like they used to say in Japanese term for karate. Because when you train with your friends, you're training in an environment to know that that person is not going to take your head off as mm. opposed to training with real violence in knowing that, Hey, if you don't move right now, you're going to get hit. 
So how you deal with your adrenaline rush going through your body and what's going to happen, the outcome, and this is where the techniques comes into place. It's always refer, since I'm still learning and I still acquire a lot of different knowledge, not only in terms of martial arts and different of tactics. And for about so many years, I've been studying different great martial artists or great artists in their art of their own. And I've studied with um, coach Tony Blower. And I like his analogy of referring to weapon as you flinch. Because the first thing that's going to happen if you're in danger, you're going to flinch. And mm. if you don't weaponize that flinch and you don't control that fear, you would not be able to use the library of techniques that you have and you've learned throughout so many years. You know, it's learning through a curve of martial arts training to explain and elaborate on the subject. And you've learned all your different forms and cadence belts for Japanese martial arts, as you mentioned, karate before. It's a belt system. You have a yellow belt and it goes up in different colors, sorry. And uh, learning this belt, it doesn't mean if you were to put into a scenario on the street where someone is going to attack you, or bully you, or choke you, or grab you by the throat, that you will know what to do, you know? And I like his analogy because if you go training in, in a, I don't want to bag karate on this podcast, but I mean, if you were training in, I will call it martial arts. Mm. If you were training in a martial arts dojo or environment, nice. every. <laughs> if you were training because uh, I love karate don't get me wrong I still I still love to practice some of the moves of karate and I, and I still refer and practice um, some of these techniques with different great martial artists which I admire you know and you mentioned George St. Pierre he's learned karate and look at him now he's uh, obviously a great professional fighter which is incredible mm. um, but my understanding when you teach and what, what I do at the moment is I teach people with all abilities to be able to protect themselves and feel empowered and increase that self-confidence. Mm. What's important in doing so is you only have a short amount of time. It's like the first impression, first impression on the workplace, first impression on a date, the first impression on the first thing that you would do if something was going to happen to you. What will be your reaction? Would you be scared? Would you flinch? Would you go in a federal position and start crying because you're facing danger for the first time? It's different. So if you know how to deal with danger and real violence, then you have more chance and time to realize, hey, hang on, not only do you know how to deal with danger, but you know what to do in that time. You know, mm. uh, For instance, uh, I just got off track right now, but we we're talking about being in a dojo in a safe environment every day. Yeah. And people will come in and say, I want to learn self-defense. I want to learn how to get out of a choke. I said, great, but I, I, I will teach you, obviously, on how to get out of a choke if, if you would like to. Um, when it comes to that, when it comes to terms, when I feel like you can get out of a truck, she's like, yeah, but what if someone do this? Cause they do a lot of different workshops. And they said, what if you do that? I said, well, simple answer for me is karate to be good. Someone asks you, you will train four times a week to be able to reach to your belt level. And you want to train to get out uh, away from a truck. But what are you doing? If you're training an hour per day, four times a week, which is four hours. And to be good at it, you would do this repetitively the same technique and you will train yourself for three hours on how to get into a choke before you can get out of it so you will allow yourself to get into the choke position oh. to know okay this is what i can do to get out of this choke and the problem i have with this is not only you can and you're training yourself to be good and to get out of this choke but you also getting comfortable to the person who's putting on a truck. It doesn't mean that the same person, the same partner, the same uh, attitude or the, the aggression will be replicated the same in a real life scenario. Someone could be on drug. Someone could, someone could have a virus and you don't want to get close to them and you're going to freak out because you're going to think that you're going to die anyway. And, and it's the truth. The truth is how you're going to react to a situation is more important to get used to sure to think that you can do it unless you've done this before you know that's why different skill training different military base the, the police officers everyone has different type of training mm. if you want to know what to do in a real life scenario training violence you train with violence you know similar to someone who's going to study and i will talk about a anything on how to be a builder you know if we, we can have if, if i have my kids will be a builder one day and they're showing me all this great work that they're doing at home. It's like, I've learned this at school that it's amazing. I will think, and he's at the top of his class. He will be number one. I'll be proud of him. But hey, I have to be very honest. Would he be able to work under pressure? 
as soon as he leaves uni, if I put him in the workplace, it's different yeah. because not only you have to put your skill set into play, but you also have to deal with the pressure that comes in. Mm. You know? So it's not only having the skill set to be able to apply it, but it's also having the ability to deal with pressure. So what I do, I teach people and anyone that would come into our program on how to feed off pressure and change it into motivation so they can apply the best ability and skill set to their task so they can achieve the best results. Is that kind of what Aikido is all about? Using force, the force of somebody else to kind of redirect into into a like a defense? Or have I completely misconstrued that? Well, it, it, it is a concept of it, of obviously deviating force of the opponent coming towards you uh, to be able to get out of the way. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So you almost like you're... Well, okay. there's, there's, there are so many points that I want to pick up on here. Um, and I think we're going to end in there naturally. If we go back to, to your story around how you developed um, as a kid and how your your karate training, you know, how long you were doing karate for and where where that took you. When when did you, how long have you, were you in Mauritius for before you, you made the move to Australia? Or, to come to, to Australia? Oh, well, I moved to Australia in, I think, 2007. Why? Right. End of 2007. And before that, were you in Mauritius or were you in another? I was in Mauritius. I was in Mauritius. Yeah. Okay. So you, you did a lot of your, most of your training in I did a lot of Mauritius. Martial, Ma, Mauritius. Yeah. And was it, so it was karate in Mauritius? What else was there in Mauritius? I did karate. I did Aikido. And mm -hmm. I also did kickboxing in Mauritius. Okay. Did you ever take it on, uh, did you ever want to compete? Yeah, I did just some little amateur fight uh, when I was doing kickboxing mainly. Yeah, and karate was just basically point sparring and sparring with each other, mm. but nothing has a proper competition for karate uh, where you will be going like we have right now. And did they have like a mixed martial arts scene on, in Mauritius at the time? Like, how old were you then? Yeah, they, they did have mixed martial arts. I was about my twenties at the time. Okay, early yeah. twenty, late twenties. But they did have not as we have a proper. Um, center where we have different type of martial arts and jiu-jitsu all together you have it you will have places where you have days and these people will be teaching you some mm. groundwork and boxing but it's not obviously hasn't evolved as much as it is right now at the time that it was there yeah. you have to travel to different places to be able to learn different skill set in martial arts and different instructors we had one place where i was training and we had a sort of a center where we have different level and uh, we had a, this is where we had Aikido and we had Kung Fu, which I did Kung Fu as well uh, when I was there. But I wasn't intense as much as I did it in Melbourne. I was practicing Wushu uh, just because I wanted to know what Wushu was about. I did it for at least 12 months in parallel of, of doing Aikido when I was training. But there was a center where there was different level and there was different type of training just mm. for people who come in and they will be teaching Aikido and uh, uh, karate and, and, and Kung Fu and on the other side it will be boxing and kickboxing but the difference is compared to what we have here we'll go to a place we'll go to a center we'll go to a gym like we have in Australia and we'll have the same place the same center all the different classes will be there so it yeah. was obviously different the environment was different it wasn't connected together yeah it was even though it wasn't in the, it was in the same building it was still different yeah um, okay I see different environment it, yeah. it wouldn't be mixed. It wouldn't be understanding. It wouldn't be like me saying to you, okay, like you said, is that what we do in Aikido? Can we just incorporate that movement in what we're doing right now so we can learn the principle of Aikido on that fighting that force and, you know, utilizing the other person's energy and to be able to take them down? It, it wasn't like that mm. at, at the time that I was training. So, but I was understanding. The, the thing is, sorry. To, um, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just saying that I, my, my concept was I wanted to do this. I wanted to be uh, the reason I wanted to learn all these different moves because it was inspiring for me to see these different concepts. And I wanted to see if it would work that way. I wanted to see if it would work if I was practicing kickboxing and kicking like a kickboxer, because which is very important because when you learn different style, they, they teach you on how to defend, they teach you uh, on your kata. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. If someone will punch you, this is how you will do this different move. If you will do, um, 
karate, you will teach you on different type of block. And I thought, okay, but who's punching me? Who is kicking me? And I was trying to study at the time and, and looking at a, a kickboxer, they will, they will be kicking a bag, they were kicking a heavy bag or, or pad drill. So you can see the intensity going through the kick. And I, and I did admire this. When we were doing karate um, in, in a hole, we didn't have hanging bags at the time. Uh, mm. Traditional karate didn't have, like we do now, you see in classes, they had pad drills and so on, you know. It was all body shot. And we're kicking you, they were kicking you in the legs, which was great. But if you realize, at the time, and this is what great part of the training they enjoy with karate, it was intense and it was strong. And it, it was making you strong by getting kicking your legs and punching into your body and so on. But obviously, in saying that, no one would really punch you to knock you out. They, w- they will punch you with some intensity, but it's not too, I'm going to kill you right now by punching you because we're training. There were just some different type of punches, which will have an impact to your body. But I didn't see that it was enough to feel like this punch could be devastating at the time because it was a kid, obviously. You know? So I thought, I'd like to see if this kickboxer is kicking me. Would that really work if I would do that technique that I was practicing in my karate school? Of course, at the time, it didn't work. (laughs) Most of the time, it didn't work, you know, because the intention was to take your leg out and the intention of the person who was training and in the safe environment of my karate club, he was making sure there was an impact to know that I could hurt, but it didn't really hurt me to feel like I could break my leg, you know. Mm. So I wanted to learn and observe different style to see, ooh, would this technique really work if I was to one day become a teacher and be able to say, hey, you should use this because this is going to help you to protect yourself against a kick or a punch and so on. So my passion to learn these different type of martial arts at the time was n- not so much to because I wanted to do whatever was out there and available to me, but also to make sure that anything that I was doing was going to be efficient. That was that has and had a purpose to it. So if I was learning this form that was in the tradition for so many years, I wanted to believe in them. So one day, if I was to use it or to teach people, uh, I will utilize the fact that it would work. You know, especially like what they're doing in mixed martial arts. They're mm. combining all these different type of martial arts. They take it to the UFC so mm. they can utilize the great skill set to know that they can win this battle with the right tools. And I was just doing this for my personal fulfillment of passion that I wanted to believe that it, this was the right um, technique to be able to learn. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to pick up on. The, in my mind, it, it kind of, why are, we, why are we doing what we're doing? So, so do we do it to defend ourselves? Do we do it just as, a, as an exercise in professional or personal development? Do we do it to compete yeah. and and kick someone else's ass because we just want to get into that sport? Um, or are there yeah. other reasons? For you, as I'm hearing you, if I'm hearing you correctly, it appears that you did it more for a personal development sort of thing and, and partially Correct. partially you wanted to prove to yourself that if somebody else were to come and, and try to cut you down, you would have something uh, to, to defend yourself with. But, but you weren't necessarily really invested in jumping into doing the competition at the moment is that have i kind of captured that accurately well uh, uh, well when you said competitions at the time um i was also remember mum was still around <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> mum is still around so i'm very blessed to have a beautiful mother like that but um it, it was also that i had to be really focused on my academic yeah and at the time physical education being in high school you were able to choose to take some boxing lesson, which was available at the school at the time. Oh, that's good. And I thought, martial arts, I want to do that, you know? Mm. But um, some of those classes to to become a really good athlete and a really good um, martial artist or boxer, you had to skip some classes at school because it was taking a lot of your time to be good because if you want to be great at what you do, you have to invest the time into it, which was was very restricted to me because uh, I had allocated time that I could be present mm. at these event because the race was more focused in the mm. academic um, part of it. Otherwise, the 
worst martial artist in the world will whip my ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good, good motivation, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so, well, I do, do, do I feel back and think I, I would have loved to drop school and, and just invest my time in competing in martial arts at the time? Yes and no. Why yes and no? Because if I would have invested my time, I would have been set with what I had at the moment and not being able to improve my self-development and learn all these different attributes that I've acquired for the last couple of years and meeting all these different people. And I had a goal when I was watching these movies when I was at the age of 9 and 10 years old. All I was thinking, I was delusional at the time. I thought one day I'd love to be able to train and meet these people. All at the time it was mainly thinking, I want to train and we'll be doing a movie together. You know? So I thought that was my dream. I had a vision. I thought I could make this happen. And I was in a small island, which we had a lot of celebrities coming through to go on holidays, but it's not as very, um, we didn't have that many doors of opportunities like we have in Australia, for instance, for people to just walk through Melbourne CBD and say, hey, there's an addition. Would you guys like to come and train? Would you like guys to be part of this extra for this movie? So it was very restricted. So my vision was very big for such a small place with no many doors of opportunities. And I had a vision and I thought, I want to make this happen one day. So that was at the back of my mind, knowing mm. that I had to be restricted for the hours of time that I could invest in my martial arts training. But I still, in parallel, wanted to focus and that improved my ability to multi-skills um, at, at things where I could focus on my academics, but at the same time, continue my vision and improve my self-development and learning these different skills of martial arts to one day be perfect at at um, demonstrating what I have to do, whether training with my friends, because I would catch up with friends who were doing different type of martial arts and will, they will think, oh, this guy's doing karate. He would have known how to do, you know, a, a boxing pose, or spinning back kick or wrist lock and so on. And I would surprise them and we're like, oh my God, how did you know that? I said, don't you worry. <laughs> you know, I used the love to be secretive about um, my skill set and what I was doing to improve myself which was very important to me at the time because I didn't want to put everything out on the open and people will be able to trick me and my friends say, oh, this guy only knows karate. He doesn't know how to kick like a kickboxer, for instance, you know? So I was perfecting myself in a way for my own self-development and at the same time listening to my parents and making sure that I was very um, focused in my academic studies. There's a lot of intrigue and, uh, there as well. Like when you're when you're secretive uh, to a particular set, the skill set that you have, uh, or you like even in the in the academic uh, setting, you can kind of just say something that like, oh, I didn't know this person had that in them. Um, you know, you may use a word or you may uh, you know show a skill or something. It's kind of like it creates a sense of intrigue there and that is attractive. I mean, in, in an end, from a, from a social point of view, uh, from a relationship point of view, but also from a, you know, leadership perspective, it's kind of, it's an interesting one. It's, it's interesting because I've done so many interviews in my life, radio, TVs, and, and I've never, never mentioned this before. It must be your skill as psychotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> it's true because uh, thinking back, thinking back, um, when I was at school, no, no one knew I was doing martial arts. No one knew I was I was training. No, no mm. one knew I was in a scout club, and no one knew that I was doing martial arts. In fact, no one really knew I was doing martial arts until I started um, coming up with these. Sifu Damien page and, and, and Facebook, which my brother started for me. And, wow. and it was quite intriguing for so many people. It was like, oh my God, I didn't know he does this, you know? And uh, that's fascinating. And I didn't never told anyone. Well, the school found out once because I was getting bullied when I was at school. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid. How old were you when you were going through that? I was, I was in primary school. So. Yeah. Yeah. Eight, seven, eight. Yep, yep, yep. It happens, you know, irregularly in terms of time frames. You know, it happens in high school a little bit. Mm. And I remember in high school, I probably was at the age of 12 years old. I'm just going to my memory bank looking up right now. Yeah. I was at the age of 12 years old and, uh, and I couldn't take it. <laughs> I just couldn't take it. And I did the worst thing that I could ever 
advise someone in these days and doing this bullying campaign, what will be the solution? I do regret it. I thought mm. maybe I could have done something different. But um, I remember one of the guy could constantly making comments and pushing me around and grabbing me and pushing me to in the whole way. And one day he was sitting down and I just stood up and I gave him such a big kick to the ear and he just stopped. My bullying career <laughs> stopped. started from then. And people thought, no, nah, it started because people thought I was the bully because I ah. stood up for myself for once, you know? Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, this guy's crazy because no one knew I never talk about it to anyone. I was just giving yeah. it to myself. And all of a sudden this guy just stood up to this big guy. And yep. kick him in the ear and he started yep. bleeding and I felt bad and I felt great inside, but I felt bad yep. at the same time at the time because I just stood up for myself and I just hurt someone and, uh, and it just stopped mm. completely. So people thought it was the bully. They would come to me and like, Oh, this guy's annoying me. What should we do? I'm like, let's beat him up. Let's take him to the schoolyard. I'm like, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was bad. And I felt, and I feel really bad for this because all I wanted to do is I wanted to feel like I could use my legs and kick to fight my bullies, you know, but I, I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't thought this is going to be the solution. And I, and I just walked away from every fighting scenario at the time and feel like it's not a solution just to keep fighting. First of all, cause I know how bad it will be at home if my parents find out <laughs> that I'm just thinking that punching motivator will be the, mm. you know, it will be, um, the solution to score, but this is where it started. This is where I felt great. I felt like it was useful just to kick someone. And because mind I was you, getting bullied for so many years. Well, children at that point in time, especially, all right. So we got to understand maturity here. Like when you're when you're such a you know young child, your brain from from twelve to twenty four years of age, you're in that adolescence period from a brain point of view, yeah. and your brain's going through so many changes. One of those changes is a very social social like leaving the parents nest and trying to develop yourself or, or kind of work towards your own social standing within a community and you you can only take like any kid can only take so much um, because before they begin to use this whatever skills that they have to try to stand up for themselves and for many people uh, that's all is that's required before you know, bullying stops someone to just jump out and say, nah, enough of this. The skill is how do you learn? Like, cause aggression is everyone thinks about aggression as a negative thing. Uh, well, I it. wouldn't say everyone I would, I actually look at aggression or controlled aggression as a really positive element of assertiveness of being able to assert yourself and be able to build yourself up. And you, you look at that from the, from an animal kingdom point of view, it's, really really important to develop your own standing in in the hierarchy of those around you and if somebody can look at you and say hey this this guy's not to be messed with then your social standing begins to 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 be recognized as hey this is a person that we can rely on because he's strong and it, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> one. but as kids we kind of lose that at a time because we're still working on self-regulation our brain's still making these exactly. emotional outbursts you know, we can look back and say, oh, I did a lot of crap stuff. I, you know, for me, when I look back, uh, when I was uh, a a kid in primary school, in high school, I got into so many fights. My, my whole standing was about, you know, who can I beat up and how can I be known as, yeah. as a guy not to be messed with? And that was as much about insecurity as anything else. Uh, and it's only later that exactly. you start to understand that. But, but yeah, picking up on that theme that it's a really interesting and it's a really human experience that you know everyone goes through you want to make that stand and it's better to make the stand than not to make the stand because because Absolutely. then you can actually regulate it there's a saying uh better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a wall very true so very it's, it's true it reminded of... me i did uh i did a podcast with um uh, with richard norton as you as you know i was trying to get myself busy last year when the first lockdown happened and started doing some podcasts, which, mm. which I do believe that people, like you said, once you make that, that step, people sort of look up to you and they're like, Oh, this guy is very strong. He's very, he's got a very strong mindset. And I, I, like, I wanted to tell people that I wasn't born with this, you know, I get inspired from others and, and I'd like to share that knowledge to everyone. And I started in this podcast and, 
Richard Norton mentioned exactly what you said, and, and I think it's uh, it's beautiful and it's very true. And it's also important, as you as you mentioned before, that it's important to take a stand. At what time is it right for you to take that stand? And uh, when you look at bullying, especially, we take a lot of different um, approach to, and pathways to help the victims and, and the bullies. It's all good for others to take a stand for yourself and support you, but it's also important for you to know what you should do to take a stand for yourself. Mm. Does that mean for you to stand up and beat up someone? No. You know, does that mean for you, it's wrong to not beat up someone or this, not to say anything? What would happen if someone will raise their hands if you take a stand for you? What do you do in these circumstances? Every individual, every different case is a completely different. And what I'd like to take, and so far it's been successful to be able to teach kids bullying. When we talk about martial arts, people have this taboo thinking that a martial arts is all about teaching violence. I'd like to change that concept. I'd like to reach out to people to learn that martial arts is a way for me to get to the kids. It's like for them to watch the superheroes. If I would say to them that the superheroes is there, regardless of what that superhero is in real life, they wouldn't see that picture. It's like a kid in a candy store. You just have to get them buying. Once they're buying, you can educate them in the right way to be able to enhance their way of thinking and improve their self-confidence by getting them buying, getting them what they want to mm. see. So by utilizing martial arts, it's a great, it's, it's like a forum to bring the people together. We change their state of mind and then we talk about the subject. Uh, so going to what would you do if you get bullied at school? I wouldn't want them to beat a kid. I wouldn't want them to, even though if you're getting beaten up at school, which I feel really bad, and I know I didn't do what I'm telling them to do, but I know it works because my experience at the time, I had to use my hands and legs to stop my bully. Do I regret it now? Yes, I do regret it because I could had more um, knowledge of why and it was wrong and what could have done to change his life because like we've mentioned before sometimes the bully it's, it's an insecurity and that's why they're being a bully maybe they're going maybe they're being bullied themselves by their parents and the family who's not there to nurture them to help them to grow as a kid but it's not the victim's fault and responsibility to be able to change that bully mm. but it's beautiful when you can educate kids nowadays and a younger generation what are the pathways that we can use to respect each other's empathy and, and be able to listen to it to, to someone else, for instance, you know? And um, the beauty out of doing these programs is you can see a bully t learning martial arts to know that they can be a lion if they really want to, but to know once they roar, they can stop there. Mm. They can just roar to take a stand for themselves to know if they have to use their hands, they would but they know that it can stop just by rowing and they need to utilize their hands to stop a bully. Mm. And that for me is more important because it allows them to have the skill set to be great, but knowing when they really have to use it and hoping that they never have to use it. Mm. Uh, but that helps me to feel great about it because it's utilizing violence to teach people and kids on how to not be violent. You know, yeah. But knowing that you have the skill set to do so, it's like looking at everyone that goes through the the police force. You know, they they have to learn to shoot a gun. They have to learn that if they have to utilize their um their gun to shoot, they would know that they have to use it. But you talk to so many police officers, especially in Australia, some of them have never shot a gun, shot a gun for over twenty five years in real life under pressure. You know, and that's that's a skill set that you can utilize the same principles that you have the right tools within yourself, to be mm. strong within yourself, to know what you can do to stand up from a point of view, whether you're getting bullied, whether you overwhelm with a situation and you can roll and you can take a stand from your own skill set that I'm contributing to, or our team is contributing to that, to make them feel great about themselves, which is more important. And doing that earlier on when you are able to kind of see that there's a behavior that you don't quite appreciate making that stand at the beginning, which is really tough for kids. I mean, cause kids, kids pick on each other all the time. And, and half of that is, you know, exactly. it's just, just what kids do. And then there's, there's bullying, yeah. you know, um, that, that kind exactly. of goes from there. Even, even you go onto any work site, um, 
or or tradey side. You have people calling each other names and and all that sort of, and then they laugh That's about it. it and they join each other for a drink afterwards. It's kind of like a all right. Yeah. So how can you tell, especially for for some kids who who might perceive jokes as they are being bullied. So somebody is kind of like or racism or yes, or personal yeah, right yeah. Oh, certainly, and yeah. and we live in a culture that is very. <clears throat> we try to manage people's anxieties for them, rather than teaching people how to teaching stand up to for manage. themselves. Yeah, so it's really tough. I mean, and that's what I love, love about martial arts. It's like you teach a person within that inner sense of self confidence, and the thing I love about it is it's so demonstrable that you can start to say, I'm going to do this one thing differently. And that's going to demonstrate that I can become better at that one thing. I'm a big believer in if you're 1% better every single day in a hundred days, you'll be a hundred percent different than you were a hundred days previously. You're not going to be a hundred percent of yourself, but you're going to be a hundred percent better at, at one particular thing that you're standing, you're I've, standing I've forward. Just, um, I've just lost you right now. So, <laughs> so what I was saying uh, is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if there's a bit of a lag in, in, um, yeah, just that <laughs> in reception, that's all good. So I was just saying, yeah, yeah small steps you know, lead to big rewards. And that's what I love about the, the martial arts concept. Um, I've seen throughout your work, you've done a lot of, you've done a lot of traveling and you've been able to meet a lot of really interesting people. Uh, you, you met your childhood, um, you know, the person that you looked up to when you were watching movies, Van Damme, you, you met, you met people like Steven Seagal and you've met people like, uh, even Georges St. Pierre and, John uh, Sin. Yeah. and uh, yeah, John Cena. Yeah. <laughs> John Cena as well. Yeah, it's... <laughs> in, in your experience, what, what's, um, What's it like meeting somebody that you've seen in so many other contexts? They don't know you're alive, but you kind of have grown yeah. up with this sort of thing. And you're like, you finally meet somebody else that you kind of, you look up to. What, what was that for you? What was that like for you? Well, it, it was a strange feeling, to be honest. It was, um, it was obviously gratifying to know. And I'm sorry, it's going to get out of context. Uh, it's to use the principle when I'm teaching is, I think it's important to, to look strong, you know, in a gender that if you say you're going to do something and you do it, it people pay attention to that. You know, if you teach a skill set to the younger generation, and if you say you want to do something and you have people supporting you and helping you to do and achieve that dream, it's very important. It makes you, it makes you, um, your self-worth, you know, it, it improves your self-confidence that you're, worthy and you have the ability to do so but when you get there it, it's a journey <laughs> it doesn't feel as exciting as you would have felt willing to get there you know so meeting some of these different incredible individuals of the, the trade of martial arts when 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 i look up to them and and being into that field obviously i met them 20 years later 25 years later of watching these movies and and it's like talking to the same people in the same environment. And they, they're like us. They're just normal human being with, you know, with great humor. You know, some of them has got a great character. Some of them has got different characters. But it's, it's gratifying to know for me personally that I was able to achieve that moment. Now, meeting this individual in person, um, I would talk about. I don't know, Steven Seagal, the, the, the skill set, we spent a lot of time together when he was touring in Sydney and in Melbourne. I was touring with him, helping him to do his workshops. And it was gratifying when we were, it was exciting moment when we were touching hands and doing some technique together. I was going back to my childhood. I'm like, oh my God, holy crap, I, I made it. <laughs> I made it. Now, it, the, the worst the worst feeling out of this was he was excited and he, and he thanked me because at the time he was looking for someone to, to help him that's done a keto to be able to run for this workshop and to assist him into his seminars in, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago. I can't remember how long ago it was. And uh, through a friend of mine, Dan, who brings a lot of celebrities in Melbourne. 
And when he asked that, and when I got there to his to the hotel in Sydney, and he's like, "Oh, thank you so much for being there," but when he said thank you to me, it it didn't occur to me that he was thanking me for being there with my skill set to support this seminar that I was doing when 20 years ago I was working so hard that I could thank him for being giving me the opportunity to be there and to be able to meet one idol that inspired me in the Aikido world, which made it famous through the movie that I watched above the law, which was an incredible movie. And it's funny because people think I call my son Nico because of Steven Seagal. <laughs> I probably did. He probably, I'll probably take it's that. A, sub, subliminal. That. <laughs> you know, so I, lo- I love that movie because it, it was a, it was very catchy and it was exciting. But for so many years, I was just waiting for the moment that I could make that happen. Mm. And when I walked in and that conversation just had a twist and it made me realize, and I was just silent and quiet and just, digging that in and that 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 moment you know thinking oh my god i shouldn't say anything just stay calm you're professional someone is thanking you to be there to support them instead of me i had this this paper written into my head this the spill this is what i'm gonna say hey I, I was inspired since i was watching the movies thanks so much for the opportunity i can't wait let's take a photo let's do some aikido movement together i'm just so excited but in return it was very down to earth and thanking me for the mm all the time that I took away from my family to be there for him. And I thought, geez, that was, that was beautiful. That was it. That was a good moment. And, and, and that moment made me realize, and, and I completely forgot about how excited I was to meet Steven Seagal at the time, who was a great martial artist that was looking up um, and playing a role of obviously different character in different movies, but utilizing Akira as a skill set made me realize that none of this mattered. He supported me for that journey to become the person who I am today, mm. and he was humble to to tell me, "Hey, thanks, thank you so much." He's like, "Thank you, brother." That was a talk. Thank you, brother, for being here today. I'm like, "Oh my God, this guy's calling me brother. Look at that." <laughs> and you're gonna remember yeah, that. Uh, you're gonna take that for a very long time. It's it's really when you visualize the memory, or you try to just allow it to download into into your mind, that that sticks with you and. I, I feel like that's that's what confidence is all about when it comes down to downloading something that you have done or something that has happened to you that has given you a boost that gives you a sense that you can kind of build on from you know another step into the right direction and when you when you say something like okay well I've, I've made it you know I've I've gotten there I've set myself a goal and I've been single-minded about that goal and there's two things there there's sticking to a path that you've ordained for yourself no matter how difficult it is and and the second one is telling the truth and for you it's telling the truth to yourself you know what for me i believe that the truth and honesty is everything and reaching out to, to 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 teaching kids and we, we do so many different school groups. We teach pretty much all the schools in, in Victoria. We do a lot of Zoom classes, international um, students around the world. And it's, I like the fact, if you can't get away from the fact, the fact is it's the truth. And, and when my parent still sent me this, um, this certificate of just as a reminder for them, because they, they always use that as a trigger to my uh, the start of my passion to to achieve martial arts, and I look back, and, and for them, it's a proof. It's a proven fact that I wasn't lying. I, I'm talking to you right now, and you're like, "Oh yeah, that's right." He he can't change a a result from C and D to A in six months. That's impossible. But no, it, it's there. I've got it. <laughs> yeah, it's you know? and that's the thing. I, I, it drives you. I've got it. It drives me, and and I believe that if I can incorporate these principles to educate the younger generation and also help the older generation to do so in having and incorporating pathways to help them to be stronger within themselves to take a stand for whatever they're going through it's possible and i use those principles as blueprint people would ask me hey how do you stay motivated i said motivation is temporary yes a feed of the pressure that we have every day to be able to motivate myself but that's not good enough i said to you at the start of this I hate my hair, 
because my motivation is to make sure that I look good and I hit the gym and I train every day because it's important to be good and healthy. And uh, my discipline is to make sure I have a haircut every week. Lucky I have a great barber to support that. <laughs> but you need to be disciplined and consistent in everything that you do. And if you say you're going to do something, you got to do whatever it takes to make that happen in a good, obviously, um, not a good manner of the words that I'm trying to, to think of is to make sure you do everything possible in a proper um, pathway that you want to take. You know, you want to say like, if you want to become a bodybuilder, do whatever it takes. You don't want to shoot yourself with steroid and say, I want to be built. No, do the right thing and utilize the right support network to be able to do so. Today we're doing a podcast, and I and I, and I wasn't the type of guy that want to listen to a podcast. I, I just want to watch a good action movie because that will pep me up to hit the gym and go downstairs and start working out training. You know that was my inspiration to be consistent, to know that no matter how I'm feeling right now, I could be feeling down. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously within the negative events and negative environment and negative talks that people are going through. You, you, you have to listen to some of them. Some of them as your relatives and you, you will listen and take it in. But what am I going to do for myself to get over this and to get back on track again? I'll watch an action movie. I will, I will do some exercise. I, I will be disciplined. And, and I will also surround myself with the people that have the same principles and vision because it helps me to know that, okay, if I'm going to be calling this person today, I know exactly what will be the outcome. It's like, hey, what are we doing today? Are we training? Are we having a Zoom? Are we going to talk about motivation? Are we talking what's the pathways we can do to help others? It's going to help me to stay on track. And I believe it's very important to educate people. What can they do to be able to help them to stay on track? You know, if it's like if you want to change your life in six months, just try to do something consistently for six months, regardless of what it is. Just stop eating meat, for instance, or just stop drinking alcohol for six months. And you can see something is going to change. Your mood is going to change, your, your body is going to change, or you know, your relationship is going to change. And utilizing all these different pathways, it's going to help everything. You're going to be, when you're honest in yourself, it helps you to be good in a relationship where you can take a stand for yourself. You'll be good and you will know your worth if you have to be in a workplace. If someone is saying to you, you're not good enough, you would know that you're good enough because you have achieved everything and improve yourself, educate yourself, listen to podcasts, grab knowledge and information everywhere to make you a better person. So going back to... In, 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 in terms of what I was saying is within all these abilities and pathways is when I look forward and people's like, oh, so you've met all these great martial artists. You've met Steven Seagal, John Cena, John Claude Van Damme, Scott Atkins and Michael J. White, all these great inspirational martial artists. Initially, you wanted to be like them. Who do you want to be in, in five years? What's your five-year plan after doing all these programs and training that you're doing? I said, well, I just want to be a better version of myself. And for me, and, and, and I realized by meeting all these great individuals, it helps me to, be, to frame my pathway and to look forward and say, I want to be better than I am today within the skill set that I'm trying to achieve and, and acquire from the things that I'm doing and from the people I surround myself with. And that's my goal, to always be better than I am today. I really like what you said about the disciplined element of kind of moving forward, because when it comes down to discipline, it's so practical. It really is so practical if you, if you kind of put it into small and simple steps to move forward. And no matter what that discipline is, I mean, you mentioned it could be, you know, becoming a bodybuilder, it could be becoming a martial artist, it could just be, um, I want to get an A on my, uh, on my report card so that I can start martial arts or something else, you know, yeah. choose your discipline and be able to break it down into steps and make sure that you're doing that 1% better every single day. Uh, you know, some of my clients have an issue with the word better. Um, I don't, but, but for some people they, they may. So I guess when it comes to, uh, to changing things, it could be do something 1% differently and see what happens, you know, try this for a week and be disciplined in your process because people who, who 
are not able to discipline themselves and discipline's gotten a bad rap i think in our culture today because we we value instant gratification and pleasure yeah. more so than we do about you know sticking to becoming a better version of you through the actions that you take but i would say that discipline and in turn self regulation is one of the most important areas that you can build on and there's a lot of research to back this up. I mean, the, the social psychologist, uh, Roy Baumeister has done plenty of research. He leads the field in self-regulation research yes. and that, that not self-esteem, but self-regulation is the best predictor to overall health, uh, and development and better, better job, better pay, better, better relationships. That's what, what defines it. So I love how you, how you put it forward towards the discipline. Tell me about discipline as it relates to confidence. Well, discipline for me to relate to confidence is the things that I have to do to get there. So we'll talk about some of my clients. They, they come into martial arts because they want to be able to unleash the stress and the pressure that they have on a daily basis, whether they want to do some exercise, they want to get fatigued, they want to get tired because they want to be able to sleep at night time. So they will come to martial arts, not because they want to be a great martial artist, because they know, or someone told them, do some exercise, you're going to get fit, you're going to be able to sleep, your body's going to get tired, and it's going to make you feel better. Mm. It's the truth. So they come in with a task for me to do that I would have to make sure that they feel better after their training. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a blueprint that I can cater for everyone in the class utilizing the same principle. So I always go to the fact that happiness, happiness, what, what do you do to make you happy? If you come to me and, and if I have a bad day, or it's in the afternoon and I'm, we're listening to the news and we're trying to deal with changes and everyone is affected by negative events and impact that happens to them on the day. I have to do something to make sure I have a smile on my face when you're going to come to see me this afternoon because I know that would change it. I know that you're coming to see me in the afternoon if we're doing a class in the afternoon or in the morning because you want to see that smile Preach on my it. face. And Preach it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and me being happy to uh, you being happy to see me and I have to be happy when you see me because that's what you're here for, right? Mm. So it, it's like a, a candy store. We're talking about kids. Kids see a candy. They're happy regardless of their state of mind. They, they just see candies like, I want this candy. And I, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Start crying. Stop crying. Do whatever you want, mom and dad, so I can get this slowly. So what I believe is changing your state of mind is very, very important for you to do what you think is right what you have to do to get to where you want to be so what i'm trying to explain that is we'll take an example in in december everyone has this little planner this is what i'm going to do in january i'm going to join this gym because this is going to be good for me i'm going to start doing this i'm going to be healthy i'm going to the list is incredible when it gets to the 21st of january only five percent of these people will stick to what they say and the reason for that, it's not because they don't want to. It's not because they, they can't do so. Because obviously with a plan, they had a plan that they can allocate Thursday to be able to do exercise or Friday to catch up with X and Y, you know. Mm. But what happened is their state of mind changes every day. Mm. They've been affected by what we call life. So for me, discipline is the truth. The discipline is... If you can do everything on it every every day on a daily basis, if you can do something to change your state of mind to what it was when you got excited to be motivated to say, this is my list and have this every day, it would help you to achieve the minimum. It's like a first day. I talked mm. to couples that comes to my training. I said, hey, regardless of what's going through into your relationship, you have to remember one thing. When you first met your partner, you both came in being happy on that first date. Whether you were at the movies, you were at a bar, you were at a club, no one came in with their work issues. No one came in with what's going on in the news. No one came in to trigger because my pants is too tight. I have to go shopping and so on. But everyone came in on the day with one thing. They were happy to see each other. And for this, you need to be able to bring this up into a, a healthy relationship of a healthy habits. It's called a habit planner. 
You want to be happy when you see each other. And it's going to have a healthy relationship. When you come to training, you don't want to come to training because someone told you to. You want to come to training because you're happy. What's in there for you? What's in there for you is the benefit. You're going to improve your skills. You're going to feel great. You're going to sleep well. And some people look at reward. You're going to have your next belt. We are working towards your next belt. It's a job of the instructor to make sure that obviously you're being rewarded for being here today. Words of encouragement, you know? So as an individual, what truly makes you happy? Watching a funny movie. Make sure before you sleep at nighttime, watch something that's funny. Brings a bit of humor. You sleep well. When you wake up in the morning, that's the first thing that you're going to remember. It's just going to change your day. Get off social media. Read a book. You know, have fun. Do some exercise. Do some activities with your kids Mm. or your family. So in every pathway, in every life, in every different relationship or issues or cultures, there's something that you guys do or anyone would do to bring happiness. And I believe if you can incorporate anything that brings happiness in your day-to-day life, it's going to change your state of mind to do the things that you're meant to do. So some Mm -hmm. people watching a movie is fun, making the kids happy, doing some painting, doing some, I love cooking. I'll rather cook. So I will, at seven o'clock at night, I'm always start cooking. That'll make me happy because everyone is going to enjoy their meal. Mm. And that after that, changing that state of mind, I will be more positive to think, okay, this is what I have to do tomorrow. And I'll get on to doing my planning. I'm a planner. This is what we're going to draft and we're going to plan for tomorrow. Mm. So in terms of discipline, for you to achieve what you want to do or what you think you want to get at or you want to, you want to buy a house, you want to do this, you need to start planning, but you need to have a habit of being happy to change that state of mind to do what you have to do. How important is having that, how important is having a mentor in this process? Someone that can guide you, somebody that can encourage and, and work you and challenge you. You, you just sorry, you just froze. <laughs> <laughs> how important is having how important is having a mentor in this process, someone that can challenge you, someone that can guide you in the process of, of you know, that? Well, the, the mentor is a work in progress. The mentor is, is very important and it can be anything. It could be someone, it could be a podcast, it could be a YouTube video, it could be talking to a friend, talking to your partner. And that's why they say your net worth is your network, if you know on those mm. wealth mindset planner. So who you surround yourself is very important. Your support network, your foundations is very, very important. So um, I I wouldn't, personally, I'm tend to think that it's really important to have a mentor because if someone is struggling at the moment, it's really hard for them to speak up. You know, we have hotlines and different phone numbers to call in case you're going through depression. Most of these people, it's really hard. If they haven't been able to speak up to their to their friends and family, it's really hard to take that step. to say, hey, I've got a problem. Can you help me? Or mm. I think you'll be clouded with so much information, so my vision, I need help with this. It's really hard for that person to make that first step. So a mentor is someone that would listen to you and guide you, will utilize what you have and say, hey, I think you can do this tomorrow. So it's really hard to feel like everyone has access to a mentor personally to tailor their needs. Um, I tend to believe that it's important to have pathways to access those informations and make it your day to day life. As an instance, to to talk about listening to a podcast, Mm. um, talk about, I get the kids to watch a true events movie, life story, a true fact. This is what happened. Mm. And it's inspiring because it's true. It's real. It's, you know, it makes more sense. And it sort of create that, that, um, that brain to work in getting their thought and thinking, Oh my God, this really happens. You know, Mm. watching documentaries, a mentor could be for me, anything. It could just be someone just simply because it's really hard to, have one person as a yeah. mentor, different mentors to be accessible for everyone who needs it. Mm. I get my kids to uh, listen to the Warrior Kid podcast. I don't know if you've heard of that one or if our listeners have heard no. of that one. Um, there's a there's a uh, former Marine, uh, so a Navy, so Navy SEAL, not a Marine, uh, called Jocko Willink. And Jocko, okay. Jocko Willink, uh, he talks a lot about discipline. And he, on his Instagram, he has got a, um, a picture every day of his watch 
at 4.30 in the morning or around about then that he wakes up every single day, um, you know, barring none, and he just gets on it and he just get this done. And so he's, um, he's got his own podcast for if anyone's interested uh, called the Jocko Willink or the Jocko podcast. But the Warrior Kid uh, podcast is all about you know, kids posing questions and he's kind of just responding to those questions from a uh, you know, disciplined point of view, a motivational point of view, you know, and, you know, these are things that you can do to, to get better at, at becoming disciplined on discipline. I want to, I want to pick your brain, Damien. Uh, what does your day look like? How do you discipline yourself? How do I discipline myself? Yeah. Well, I try to get up early in the morning and do some exercise. Um, Doing exercise makes me really happy, and I'm addicted to coffee. <laughs> I need to have a coffee. <laughs> yes, yeah, you yeah. can tell. I had to get up before and have a coffee. And, and coffee, not so much because people think it's going to be um, a good source of caffeine to be able to get me going and pumped up. But coffee is just a discipline. It makes me happy yeah. to be able to enjoy my coffee in the morning and uh, just to take some fresh air and just to go up. I, I go training, obviously, before where we are allowed to get out in training. I used to go at 5.30 in the morning, and I would just do some training, and it would help me to change my state of mind, mm -hmm. to be able to tackle my day, and uh, obviously do the things that I have to do for work, and making sure that I get some exercise, get the family involved. Um, we get involved into very healthy habits of eating healthy and planning and making it fun. So it's all about, for me, as you, as you all know by now, I love martial arts, so I need to make sure that I have a bit of martial arts on my daily today um, mm. basis, so I can improve myself and also feel good about myself. Mm. And you, you've got you've got a family, you've got kids. I mean, you're juggling more than one thing. It's not like you're a single dude who's just, yeah, just <laughs> interested in martial arts. It's like so for for this traveling around the world and learning yeah. about martial arts. And, and so I really <laughs> want to make this. Um, I want to make this applicable to just anyone who who's trying to juggle family, who's trying to juggle work, who's trying to juggle, you know, to becoming a bit more disciplined. What are what are some really yeah really practical examples you could give to somebody to to kind of get into that disciplined mindset? But planning is everything. I believe that planning is everything. Planning is not so much about what you have to do. Uh, we have. Uh, I'd like to have everything written down. I like to have it coming on my watch or my phone. This is like little um, alarm. This is what's going to happen at 12 o'clock. We have a meeting at two o'clock. We have a zoom or three o'clock. We have this, but I also include a mindset planner into my meeting planning um, on, on a day to day. So the things that I will do, I will listen to a short video that I made. I will listen to um, an inspiring or improving mindset of different people and, and I try to do some research about mindset. So I make sure that I do all these things on a daily basis, especially in the morning, because it helps me to be mm. able to set the tone for the day and be inspired to be able to do so. So I would also tell people it's very important for you to know what your day looks like. So you know where you utilizing your time right or where you're wasting time where you can change it and improve it, which is very, very important. You know, everyone needs to know what can they do to improve themselves. So before knowing how, what can they do what, to improve themselves, they need to know what are they currently doing at the moment. Mm. You know, so it's all good to say that I want to eat healthy, but what are you currently doing yep. right now? What time are you eating? What time are you allocating for yourself? So input, output, there's all these different analogy or obviously methodology to help people. But the things that everyone can be doing, they can literally grab a pen and paper and write down, this is what my day will look like tomorrow. By having this set, they can improve themselves by adding up, like I said, what are you doing for yourself tomorrow? What's your yeah. self-care look like tomorrow? Are you going to do some exercise? I know, like, like I do a lot, of, deal a lot with busy mothers. It's like, oh my God, you know what it's like? Get up in the morning, I have to do breakfast, and I have to do this. And I finish breakfast, I have to, to work, go back, cooking dinner for everyone. I said, well, okay, but what are you doing? to help you to do this every day? What are you doing for yourself? Mm. Versus is not doing anything for yourself, making you a good person. What are you mm. doing to help yourself to do this? I always refer to the airplane theory. When the oxygen masks come up, the first person you have to save is yourself before you can save your child or anyone else besides you. Yep. So having a mindset planner 
and a self-care planner, which is obviously the things that you will do for yourself, is as important as tackling what you have to do tomorrow. Because you can't do what you have to do tomorrow if you're not looking after yourself. Mm-hmm. And looking after yourself, and obviously every individual is different, and we try to make sure we're committed to their cultures and needs, is there's things that you can do to make you happy. Go for a walk. It's all about exercise. Make yourself look good. Do your hair. I wish you could do my hair right now, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just do something that makes you happy initially, mm-hmm. whether you're in a relationship or you're not in a relationship. And then you keep doing what you have to do to be disciplined in achieving the goals that you set for yourself. And if you don't have the goals, there is different mentors out there to help you to improve yourself within your own ability. Educate yourself. Start mm-hmm. learning something new. Everyone has a passion. Whether you're good at you know, sewing, whether you're good at training or builders or any, anything, or technology or marketing, there's always room to improve yourself. So it's very, very important. And I always tell people to make sure, even if it's not every day, but once a week, you want to find a time that you can improve yourself by educating yourself. Do mm-hmm. some research. Acquire some new skills. You know, We're always learning. There's always room to learn. And going back to the martial arts, for instance, again, I'm not bagging anyone there, but I really love traditional martial arts or their values. Traditional values are very important. It teaches you respect, it teaches you discipline, and it teaches you that being consistent in doing the things that you do, you will be able to get there. Going back to initially, I spoke about karate. The difference in karate and different type of martial arts, karate will be going up and down the hall, and doing the same thing. Well, you're going to do the block, and we're going to do this consistently for so long. And sometimes I hated it. I didn't see the value in doing this because it, I couldn't see me doing this to be a movie star. You know, so I felt like it's just going to waste of time. But it's important to know why mm. you're doing this, being consistent. So going back to this discipline, you want to be able to learn what can you do to be consistent in the things that you do. Yeah, I, I, the other the other day I was I was counselling one of my clients and. Uh, um, I came across, I just, I just blurted it out. I'm like, it's like the 1% principle. And it's just something that came to me at that, at that point. It's like, if you and something we've already talked about, if you can do something different and, and become that 1% better every single day, then you would, you would be, you know, in 25 days, you've made a, you know, 25% difference. Um, you know, if, a practical example is someone who drinks, let's say 10 beers a night. You know, reducing that to nine beers a night, you've already made a ten percent change. You know, Absolutely. If somebody somebody um, you know wakes up wakes up five minutes earlier every single morning, or just just wakes up at the same time every single morning, then you've already made a global change in your own day to day. And so this one percent principle is really important because it's achievable. That's the most you know, people make all these grand plans and say, "I want to like you." You said it before. I want to just eat healthier. Well, what the hell does that even mean? There's there's so many exactly. competing <laughs> theories on what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. All exactly. these diets out there. No, like, so many... define it man, and start to get and... into it because this is that's the huge thing. So. I really appreciate it. And I think that's actually a really good place to, to wind down. Uh, but before we do wind down, tell me, is there anything you'd like our listeners to know? Anything that, that we haven't covered so far? Uh, anything at all? Well, I, I, as I said to you, Emil, before this uh, podcast, we can keep talking on different topics uh, for a very long time. But I, I guess what I'd like everyone to do, and I hope that the audience is listening right now, what they mainly get out of this is... It's very important for me as an individual, when I set a goal, I stick by it and I do whatever I can to change the plan to get to the goal, but I don't change the goal because I think it's overwhelming and difficult and I won't be able to get to it. Nonetheless, sadly, Bruce Lee passed away and I didn't get a chance to meet him, Mm. but I was able to meet different inspiring martial artists around the world in in doing so. Uh, And I believe it's very important to stick to do your words of what you say. And in these ways, there's always a solution. And there's a lot of people that complain and find excuses and they can have libraries and website about what are the best excuses that they can use tomorrow, but always find a solution to everything. And if you can adapt that methodology to always find a solution to your problem, 
you will be in a better place when you will have to deal with them, which is very, very, and it's going to be very impactful into your life because every time there's a problem, you will know how to tackle this problem, whether they're big, small, because you'll always be able to find the right pathway to be able to find a solution because you exclude the problem and you find what you want to achieve, what you want to get, what would you like it to change and what can be done. There's always people and mentors and different resources that can help you to guide you into this. Mm. But if you bring your problem and that's all you see, it will be a little bit harder for you to do so. And also in terms of respect and self-discipline, it's very important to respect yourself and your self-worth. So when you look at the person in the mirror every day, when I, I brush my teeth in the morning, guys, so the things that I do when I brush my teeth in the morning, I always look at the person in the mirror and I want to be proud of the person I'm looking at. It's mm-hmm. very important for you to be proud of yourself before you also look at others. And if you're not, there's always ways to change it. And there's always resources out there to help. What I'd like to do is to support and empower people within that team that we have uh, to make them feel strong within themselves and teach them and educate them on how to do so so they can get back up. Mm. It's like being a parent. You know, you teach your kids on how they can hold up the furniture and hold up these little trolls so they can uh, start walking. So tomorrow when they fall, they know what to do to get back up by themselves. It's the same principles. Nothing has changed. It's just different ways of explaining it and different pathways to get them to do so. I hope um, I was able to contribute to some sort of inspiration to everyone who's listening. Yeah. And I would love to be able to to do more for the community so that they can um, see that anything is possible Mm. if they really want to achieve something. I think and it just triggered a few things uh, for me to say on, on that because I think it's really important. There's almost no excuse these days. There's so much information out that there's so much support. There's so much even free support that people can get uh, if they want to make changes. Uh, so I think, and, and to pick up on your point, uh, where you know you want to define a goal and you want to stick to it and you want to move towards it, that there's something that I came across a few months back, which was really interesting. A guy called, uh, if our listeners have heard of Jordan Peterson, or if you've heard of Jordan Peterson, um, he's a clinical psych who talks about a whole range of of topics. But when he talked about goals, he talked about the only time you should ever change direction in a goal is not, not to make it easier, but only if that direction makes your goal harder or if you're moving towards a harder goal. So you, you could be on the track to something and you're, you're going there yeah. and then you change direction because, because you're moving towards something that's bigger, that's greater. It's almost like climbing a foothill. That was your first, first goal, but then you see the mountain behind and you're like, okay, I'm going to aim for that mountain now, you know? Sure. So and the end, that's a really good, good point that you raised Damien. And, 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 and also just, just to wrap it up, if we had a, any more analogy to what I think can help people. I always see life at a rope with a lot of nuts, you know? Mm. So sometime I growing up as a kid, I had a goal. My goal was to meet this great martial artist and hoping that one day it would happen. I didn't have any time frame because I thought it was impossible. Mm. It was a vision for me that was obviously impossible to achieve it, whether I thought it could be possible because I was watching so many martial arts movies and never thought I could have all these people and meet them. In, in a, at the same time, and I was able to do so. And But then what? I have to tie myself to that knot and go back to another goal and keep going. You always want to challenge yourself mm-hmm. to be able to, to have another vision and another goal to keep you going. Because life is not about what would you do when you get to that goal, but it's that journey of satisfaction of what you've gone through mm. to to be able to do so. And, and I like to utilize those facts and, and these true events to be able to share that to to people um i just i just forget about one thing one of the things that i wanted to be saying as a joke before and i said what was my parents wanted me to be a doctor because my mom was like geez you want to be four a's and what do you want me to do mom you want to be a doctor what's wrong so anyway so she got me to join the scout club and then we have to do first aid courses and I said, great, I know how to do first aid so i know exactly what to do to be a doctor and guess what I, i was I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I did it because um, for now I've saved at least 12 lives and wow. 12 lives for people doing CPI and helping them through my first aid course. And it's some of the stories horrible because I've helped different people in different circumstances, you know, 
and it's awful. Some were drowning, some were trying to commit suicide, and a lot of different events, which was awful. But I'm grateful for having the um, the strong mindset, thinking I could do this, and this is going to help me. And being able to do first aid course has helped me to be able to utilize its skills in a moment which I've never thought at the time that would need it one day. So I'm grateful for the journey. I'm grateful for the drive that I had growing up as a kid, which had nothing to do where I'm at today, but they all contributed to be the person who I am today. So sometimes when you look at people and uh, that's going through a very tough time and it's like, I hate it. I hate that the fact that I was abused. I hate the fact that I was not given the opportunity to be like other people. I hate the fact that I wasn't wealthy. I hate the fact that I wasn't this, but when I tried tell them to get out of this bubble and look at it in a different angle. Because if you didn't go through what you've been through, you would have not been the person you are today. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you didn't go through all these negative events or maybe positive events, you wouldn't have been the person who you are today framed with all these abilities and skill set. You know? So I always encourage people to see the good in mm. every negative event that they've been through which is very important. They're inspiring words. I appreciate that, Damien. And for all our listeners who who want to find out a little bit about yourself or a bit more, where can they find you? Well, they, um, we doing, we have a company called Empower Tactical. So if you Google Empower Tactical or if you Google my name, Damien Shremetu or Sifu Damien, which is instructor for Chinese martial arts because I'm also an instructor in Wing Chun Kung Fu where mm-hmm. I've got the title from. And then they can find me on Google, on Empower Tactical, on Instagram, on Sifu Damien, or Facebook. Um, we've, we've done a lot of write-up for Black Belt Magazine in terms of training with intent, supporting others, and blueprints of martial arts that can help people. And I'd love to inspire many more people, many of your audiences as well. Thank you so much for that, Damien. And I, I wish you the very best moving forward, and I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emil.